Hello, 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 this is the investigation committee. You've committed a crime, get the fuck off the street. Yes, it says here, we've got you for grand larceny of cleaning product, staring in the mirror too long, and grabbing a plant by the stem and holding onto it. Uh, these are felony offenses. You are so tough. Yeah, yeah, to the overzealous judge with a knack for religious pension. Winter vibrance lowers through the earth unto a halt. Molecule of a remembered feeling falling diagonally. Eventuality leans on hotel balcony tossing toy cards. Twin effort cardboard stand snakes in glim proto light. Entrance of unsettling optical nonchalance. Hollow tin feeling bystanding trampled zoisa. Semi adjacent diagonal brown inverse vegetation. Forgiven dreams bloom, my opossum friend. All the time so needed as unregarding proliferal buildup. Less than fortunate mercy noise ambience. More than mindless paper planes clashing against bricks like blue and white over and over again. Now, son, what the fuck are you talking about? It's nothing more than the obituary of a virtual presentation. Well, it was a distinctly active exchange of diplomacy. It shattered in a non-deliberate layer of stroke by phase two. The machine shook literally. It sacrificed itself to standable chateau slime, reciting caffeine manuscript in knots, tasting tangled dynasty with shy a gray space for the nature of stray pity. Rather than unraveling, evolution lagoon endured in primally upbeat autonomy, recognizing the gloriously detrimental illuminated immaterial capable ignorance by the eventual required parachute cry, NEXT! All Minister Machine knew was that he was on the cross. Unlushed support dripped onto script cubes in blue light, in broken liquid, in brutally humorous public comfort. So much was outspokenly wrong with little exposure left in the shrouded image of the hallway in the cracks of his mind's eye for something right. This unified the intricate detrimentalist. An iron drum of golden monovocal fabristiche toned in all 13 of his nearly obliterate senses as he lugged. Thank you for your time. Son, I'll, I'll be honest. I don't give a f I really, I just don't give a fuck about what you had to say about uh, your uh, views on whatever the winter, uh, the blue, white, and the green, and I don't, I just don't give a fuck, all right? Why are you stealing? Why did you steal? It's a sprinter's paradise, a mindless rhythm fueled by fear, green blades glued to endless sediment fold beneath crosshatch rubber in southern suburbia. Vibrations of confederacy echo seven times in a torrent of unpleasant animosity distillate, detected somewhere in a place where camo hat and pink freckled eyelids peer jarringly, perceiving they know the content of a character. Let go, you limited worshipper. How Sprinter justifies swipe, reached hand trades ink for commercial motif, like there's a button to press which outlines the motive for continuing. It's a threatening ultimatum in which fire restores the mirror, overwhelming beyond 5,000 circles of tortured derision. To be clear, time has teleported from then to now. You're a spectacle, you howling maniac, a mystery to all bystanding beholders, a collection of holographic sand fragmenting metropolitan. Do safe friends willingly answer nothing? Should your wrists cross alchemically? Should a script of a thousand years be interpreted as fact? Should my skin reflect slate textile humility? Should a forbearing admittance explain the humor of sleep? Where is the temple of eternity to soothe this columning potter's field of introspherics? The revolving door to the dome of Asshat Safari magnetically vacuums pedestrian last man remnants of Cohesion Collective. To think we were a skip and a decapitation away from the utopia. Now it appears as though radioactive tape might catch the earth on fire. The mousetrap even clasped my hand in the beginning. In the end, at least I was tired enough to avoid cheese entirely. No more giving thanks to demonic throttling of land damned contradiction fellow. Long live cauliflower hero. May he rest in the power of three. Attention like consciousness. Retreat on your feet and remain weary of programmed reality checks. Don't let your keys float away on a smiley face balloon, and go ahead and ignore the reminder of its acquisition. Learn from me, screaming in my head gave me a headache. So what's on the menu? Peanut butter and saltine chips, memorabilia dated yesterday. 
three-dimensional blue youth standing inside an apple, the summation of culture, heritage, and universal experience, hanging on to my jeans for dear life, the edge of the plank beholds sea of minaret casualties, friendly basement, castle swap the knife, better investigate, taller, more slender, inverse gender Cassandra knows a lot more than I could, yet their branches don't fractal upward towards magnet vista, Rather, their roots act as an underground tree, with the border between dirt and air playing the role of ever-limiting fascist tour guide, merchants pitching the commodity of synchronously convinced reality, causistically engaged in the undynamic folk wisdom of real life. Remote courtyard coated in rose powder, lead bowls of silk erupt in flames aloof to cotton, dark ivory distance void sludge diseases previously joyous free-moving particle lucidity, but we're locked in need of what's behind the curtain, catabolically depleting the grand caravan of vibrational adjacency between friends and rocks. Son, don't try to tell a police officer what's the law and what isn't. I was littering just yesterday and they changed the law. Littering is legal, you can do it if you- Attention all cynics. Attention all cynics. Report to the Time Mystery Hall for cemented examination. Arrive prepared to lie prostrate under the Turkish Oshak for the Dyson test. All applicants must possess the stamina to count to 19, and all applicants must have consumed a diet of grains, snakes, and honey to melon in the weeks prior to the experiment. Successful applicants can expect to be added to the meal train. Good luck, Godspeed, and prosperous table tennis. I trained my thoughts on the ideal of ever appealing nihilism, as it was the easiest route. Lying where tiled texture meets black stringed shotgun scatter, as though each individual tendril held a fragment of my being, a memory of something I'd already forgotten, or rather simply experienced unconsciously, as often occurs. Then fluorescent and radiant beams burned cylinders in my vision, highlighting pyramids in my ceiling. Similar to the previously described fibers of unconsciousness, there were thousands of them. They were rather than directly mocking my inability to remember. The pointed structures reminded me of a blissfully visceral vacancy, unlike sorrow or joy, or even a void or meditation mind. It induced an abandonment of all conceivable thought. Nine moments of unburdened protagony, primal protagony, like being a cell or a mere building block for something larger. Just like how a cell is alive, I was alive, living in surreality, entranced by dangling, minuscule, obtruse pyramids. By the time my mind and spirit realigned into cohesion, the fluorescent beams had burned more than cylinders through the center of my pupils. I saw it all and was able to remark on it. I witnessed the absurdity of the air between the wall and the table. I questioned what entity might live within that space. I pondered its motive for existence, or even the cell's existence for that matter. Then I remembered what I had become and where I had come from, and what I had just been, and in a singular moment, more minute than a second, I justified nihilism. It was a reasonable nihilism, however. One grounded in the idea that regardless of the purpose behind it all, that it existed in the first place. You see, while some would use nihilistic thought patterns as a reason to give up, I then regarded everything that ever existed as present in the cosmic psyche. I realized that the genius of every mind-spirit connection existed within the vastness of our universe in the form of energy. Everyone and everything that has ever existed is exactly the same as we're all directly adjacent to one another. You are the humble spirited monk as much as you are the murderer, as much as you are the fern growing in the crack on the street, as much as you are the cell floating through eternity, as much as you are the grain of sand, as much as you are you, as much as you are me. The trick of it is tapping into, or rather possessing the ability to tap into, any of these infinite vibrational attitudes and frequencies. So I will no longer choose to blame the pain or idiocy of this world on the fundament of individuality. Because since we are all different, we are all also the exact same thing. Nihilism is as real as Christianity merely because they exist. They exist within one another. Neither real, neither fake. So to believe in nothing is to believe in everything. So why not believe in everything? Nothing stops a goldfish from killing itself, but it lives on anyways. The goldfish already understands that the reason for existence is merely to exist. So I await the joyous day I am able to meet the spirit of the goldfish, as I am a soul, as I will only ever be a soul, as everything that exists has a soul. I'll conversate universally as a soul with the spirit of the goldfish, 
as the spirits of desks, chairs, and limousines whiz by me through endless time and space. Everything will understand every language, method, and mode of communication. We will all exist forever, recreating ourselves thousands of times over, inhabiting every possible form as many times as we exist. It was easy to find comedy in that only three of the light bulbs shined out onto my face. The others burned out, finishing again for another cycle of its medium. Jailed conscience, what? Oh, fuck, fuck, fuck. Jailed conscience roiled inside moving car. Sun slathered rhombus revealed over arthritic water tower, lasered over human horizontal skyscape, encased by vermilion hue, crowded by shuttered gaseous hoary mellow splatter. The reality of walking into a shoe store in modern America. Slave master invented a door that opens itself. Cashier remarks in which I ignore. Saunter past socks sold separately to black and white. Ignite my cerebrum in the clearance section. Size 14 crow jumpers lie callously. I won't buy you if you can't fit on my foot, so don't tempt me. I turned away to the cashier, Levant for weeks and concurrent in retreat. Nothing was paid for making his day an inch easier. The fools never feigned the idea. One might attempt to walk out the magic door. Simple engineering error claimed space in my thoughts, and in an instant I remembered the Earth's condition. The predecessors of man comically squealing vicariously. Some remember the door, others remember a time of guileless asymmetry. And the voiceless troglodyte recalls a time of no need, or non-dependency. It's not what we want, but let's try it anyway. So it will be abnormal to say nothing, a taboo to be lost for an input. Like Easter, like a mouse covered in soot, like American soil and foreign air, like a plant growing in a parking garage, like four siblings with no cousins, like a rug sold for a cheap price, like the eyes of a cheetah with cataracts, like a child with a name, like an orange peel mangled in the grass, like the ring of an invisible telephone, like the ethereal chime of a paperclip hitting the tile, like the corner of a picture, like the frame of a beautiful dandelion, like an impactful statement, like ignorant wisdom, like toothpaste stained drapes, like a honey flavored cough drop, like a memory of youth, like a citizen dancing, charming, like a sky and no rain, what it means to be awake, aware and at the finale of reality at the same time, like the universe says, sit in the grass, it's pleasant and entertaining, I'll always keep going on anyways, although I missed my mark again, I appreciate these days. I see a plate that's too tiny to eat on. Paris is on the plate, yet Paris is in another continent. So many birds, yet they don't communicate. Is it because they don't want to or because they're not real? Why do the suitcases stay in the same place? Sitting on hardwood, looking past magazines only to view a mirror. It's impossible for a suitcase to be vain, but there it remains, twice used, but as dormant as the air surrounding it. But at least my bag of papers was still in my wallet. Picking out the cash fold on the kitchen table. I sat idle for another eternity until Mercury Girl woke up, with only a little more sleep than I had, clearly hung over, so her and I took the dog and headed out. So <laughs> I needed to reflect on the night, so I talked to her. It was completely stream of consciousness. I was literally just talking. I don't know how it got received, but it was nice, and... Oh, man. Oh, fuck it, man. <laughs> To conclude, that fateful October night was a weird one, the weirdest in fact, but I wouldn't change a thing, a single thing, but I'll claim nonsense before I look out the window of a moving car and see a season. Open-mindedness is seeing open-minded solutions. Rather have the glass see through you, go for a more expensive commodity of unfulfillment. The cashier mentioned that to me in the middle of my dream. A veil of scrutiny rushed into the future, heading towards Kansas. Finery aside, the entire altercation ended similarly to how it began with an expression of grief. Who endured this prescribable brick wall? Somebody is always getting older, I guess. Though I suspected it would be straightforward when I entered through the lobby, the whole process surrounding this casino has proven to be itself increasingly saturated in unliberated yellow conformity. Everyone seemed to be walking the mile. Paranoia caught me while I brushed my teeth. The word scam blasted through lenses of reliance and into my unconscious memory. I stood inside that dust-embroidered machine where days ago particles of marbled earth had been. There was a long chunk of filmed over dirt, separated by untold solution, then the memory of a footprint of a fool in a hat. The wall never answered my question, so I finally gave up and went to bed, ignored yet again by the benign rhythms of this infallible palisade.
Learn how to use chopsticks. Hello, you communist. Wedding or funeral? The out-of-service robot took his lunchbox to the end of the street, where the bench was, and he looked his 4,000 friends in the eyes, and he changed his mind. The headline read violence. Local resident charges Bima and eats bowl of fruit before the bewildered eyes of the disciples of the modern place of worship, stimulating their sense of reality. We are from the 2000s. We must maintain this increasingly fragile boundary between bleak weariness and intermediary nirvana. Good, good people. The time on the clock changed again. It happened while I wasn't looking. I reacted like any normal person would. My brain made all of the connections on its own. This was my comprehension on autopilot. The clock changes, but the sculpture stayed the same. Human constructed time was forever moving forward, but these novel objects only decayed. I was sitting on the floor in my room and a piece of the ceiling fell on me. What a wonder it was that I happened to be sitting on the floor at the exact place and moment that this fragment decided it could no longer stay attached to where it had been. What do you do when all you have left is a journal? I'll take it everywhere with me. Maybe one day I'll leave it somewhere. So we'll go back into the earth, where someone else could find it, and they'll take it wherever they go, whatever that's worth anyway. Plastic, leather, cards, paper, you can put these things anywhere. You can pick up a suitcase and take it outside and put it in the grass. Then you can pick up a card, someone manufactured it somewhere. You can take the card, and you can put it in a drawer inside of a furniture store. Anyone could find it, and they could interpret any number of meanings from it. A person could take something anywhere, really. To have stepped on every piece of ground in this place wouldn't have even been to have seen it all. Every piece of paper says something different. Every decision means another that wasn't made. Will anyone touch the flat side of the picture frame? No one ever touches the flat side of the picture frame. I haven't heard from you, so you must be on some pretty fantastic path. As for me, the trees still grow the same green. Memory X gets softly near the sidewalk. It's a microscopic visage that dances through the grass that's as tall as trees. And no matter how hard you listen, you can't hear it. The world is a fabrication. The world is an illusion. Peel it like an orange, if you wish. Tone and finality found Jupiter. Though they had no shovel to dig the hole, at last mortal forethought declared itself random, concluded since the grand generation, since the last time it heard the dial spin, never to foster the consequent shadow. Shy to comic lucidity, adapting choice as a silhouette to fate, neither a likeness nor a miracle. Would it be easier if we all went the same? Now it's a book that hurts to read. A motion in the daytime diluted by construct. Static discrimination preserved in scions, determined as equity and sectarian freedom, as though license were leisure, affixed fatally beyond conceivable burden, gnawed by the visible hand, invincible through a similarity of vice. Neither in contrition nor sympathy could a never-ending cloud allude to rain. I dream of the Montelvoid, on awkward air tinged favored yellow. Some informed condition warrants the book, where Zeo reads and stays the same. Like Zeo, I'll read it next time. Like Zeo, I'll grasp fulfilling requisite portrait of one complete fucking asshole remarking on the quality of the San Antonio skyline, involuntarily engaging in the most egregious, most unforetold fallacy of this modern American consumerist euphoria, the reality of living in a town you consider impressively unpleasant, untranquil in its barbecue cooking, pharmaceutical inhaling intrigues, it lures you in, making you believe the whole time that it really has an appealing lifestyle to offer. Then it rolls you up in a rug and pulls you to the world's smallest sandcastle. It has nothing and everything to do with the people here, who are either all the same or the most unique group of snake pullers ever witnessed. Not a single one has a grip. To Valerie's house we all slowly stroll. My pockets are shallow in this lime-squeezing palisadical antique jauntscape. They sell consciousness inside the Walmart eye doctor's office now. The world and yellow neo-KGB adrexone twins take turns peering into your spirit body. You can meet an old white man selling you Bob Dylan cassette tapes, and a Mexican palm reading paleo gypsy all in the same day. Now this experience is unlike any timeline you have ever pursued the void suspended actively within biorobotic ephemeral flesh you've ever had in at least this millennia. There is undesired garbage everywhere I peek. Zoom inward into this town, its entity, and all its surrounding town entities. I spent the whole of my functional development years here, inside a name crusade, inside my narrow room, living in a fantastic marrow days. However, unlike detriment, I experienced deep peace and perceived clarity. Now what? Crying from the mouths of a thousand landlocked gypsies of the former age wandering the streets with a newly found enjoyment of modern finery? 
Psi 1000. The words I spoke as I passed my bereaved neighbor. How are you? Could any infinity of his answers satisfy my seemingly unjustified hunger for the idea of sameness? If everyone goes with it, we'll all follow too. We, the only thing we have in common. We all look at the same clock. We all see the same time. Signed the note without reading it. Wisdom retreated via yearning. Signal lost after the movie's end. Same dinner for almost a year. My fiancé spoke to the dogs last weekend, so another one could contribute. My fiancé courted the evening August. Who breathed signatures? Six strychnine eyes. My fiancé rolled the dice twelve times blind to walk jagged on the main street. So dirt under grass was smeared by hope. Who saw dirt under the house recently to dirt inside her bed on a like. Losing is for living. Fruit grows seeds. Ode to a common Wednesday. Hours moved on. Smoking. Talking. Listening. A day for a common mind. A day for collective thinking. I got lucky. What day is it? The orange on the tree knows more than me. Alone in the library? No fun. I'll remember this time. Merged heart. Fluid mind. Toys for all the kids. Stay safe in your spirit. For we will all forget after the slip. And as for now, I'll line up with you at the door. You can tell me what it's like to be in front of everyone. And you can tell me what it's like to put those papers in the trash. And I'll tell you about my mail and the 13th clam pearl I received. And you'll tell me what's up and what's down. And the polar bears will just sit around in their melting ice floats and live it up to the end of the world like the rest of us. Living is the equivalency of loose change scattered along the sidewalk. But it's okay now that the leaves have grown on the trees. It's okay now that the world is going to come back. It's all okay. Are you listening? Each spoken, unwavering miracle precise. Each spoken word alluding to thousands of words nearly the same. A life ago would be a night terror and a mustard gas. A night ago, it would be a dream and a lingering discrepancy. Be the first to like this. Like, whenever is fine. What day is that? What is that? We see weirder things every day, but by God, will someone tell me what on earth that thing is? Could it be real, ephemera, a rendering error, scientifically trained nonsense, a somehow consequential blip on the cosmo-digital calendar of meaningless information? If it were a real object within the universe, surely an answer as to what exactly it is would present itself. However, to gaze radiantly at an image of such novel sensation wouldn't be to have seen a familiar something. Instead, what greets the eyes is something too mundane to exist, something intensely regular to the point of nonconformity with like serial matter, something fatal. The truth of this confusion is that we might not ever know what this token from the mirror dimension truly is, and that keeps me sane. For to know is to have gone too far over the edge of incredulity. And when a human crosses that line, the comforts of modernity will be left to a mixture of fate and chance to either be thrust into an ornament oblivion or live on under a new, non-secularist, worldwide stage. Identify what provides fulfillment. Take note of dreams. Ask anyone for a way in or out. So I thought back to a story I heard from a friend once while doing line work. Something about his family issues and a tub of ice cream being thrown along with shattered glass. Top fined me $900 for setting up shop in the finish line shoe store. Motherfucker can't sell Jankum for shit no more. Damn shame. Humanity light. Sink and fall to the floor. Thin end of October. We'll let the little things hurt. Wish to be there at dog stacked door. Little more than a rigid denial. Scroll weekly and sample breath. For sun and moon occupy the same sky. For stock in the opinionated electrical grease trap. Who's excited for the next mile? Day ponds love. Sign off, Captain. How was your day? For all who ask of me something, treat me with disdain, I dare you. I swear I'm at the conjunction of the intricate universe, and this is where the tracks shift. Just one more month. Trial and error. Except I selectively only perform errors by some intensely fatal artistry of miscellaneous fortune. Daily fault report. Forgot to brush teeth until 1.33. Thanks to the invention of religion, many civilizations have waged brutal years-long wars and also found everlasting universal love. Nothing like spiraling. This morning or this afternoon, in this cold, I see two of everything in spring. A reflection in the pool and half of that which possesses my mind. Or clap and arise and ruin the west, surprised for change. Fucking up twice. 
thus perpetuating the never-ending cycle of modern apathy everyone seems to be so engrossed in. Twin Liquors or America? Oblivion mimed as a ceiling fan. Ruined orchestral noise blared from my neighbor's second story window. I was fooled into thinking if I made it inside they'd let me continue further, to make it upstairs. Would you believe it if I told you I was scammed again? Trickery was the water that greeted my hands as I stood inside their ever-expanding yellow-tinted kitchen, washing my hands from the day's misdeeds. Made completely aware just how thrilling observing faux crystal lit ephemeric nothingness could be. There was a very simple last-minute exchange of thought. Both minds locked, awaiting an inevitable chain reaction. Obvious has prevailed within the reptile. Happiness even. Pondered memories of peace and ambiguity. Both of the planet lost the same. Neither cared. Neither lasted much longer. Take three days off, he said. Blue moments. Eating fruit. Off trees. Walk down the road. She listens to me. The world even listens to me. It happened a few times, actually. The world is easy to understand. It's what inhabits it that seems harder. Yet all anyone wants is happiness. This guy I'm familiar with named Claude offered his services as an air conditioner mechanic. Said he had unbelievably cheap rates. So I robbed him at gunpoint. This is the hill where he dug the hole. You can see part of the ladder sticking out in the middle. Blue, green, vibrant, smiting wrist. Travel pattern pulsing on my blank t-shirt. Sitting looking at Wendy. Meditating while we were hanging out with friends. But didn't tell them. Gave into that old bong water Jesus swept by your ankles fallacy. My heart jumped out of me. I fought my best friend. I screeched in my mother's face. I lived another nightmare in real life. When I look in the direction they want me to, it's as if I've obscured everything that their intentions were and made a mockery of them by merely viewing their trademark. It's rather like sticking it to the man. They felt it, I'm sure. Minus 0.035 cents in ad revenue. Big win for the freedom fighters. Smart movie. Revenge of the existential thoughts. Distance separates me and the snake. Named after time. Sheet of paper. Lifted letters. Pulled by the country for a test. Enrichment program for the survivors of Litany. The stamp designs are welcoming. Jeering at patrons of the working party. Or were they bettering themselves? Interest. Life. Conversation. Failure. Skin. Never seen. Hair makes a difference in this world. Location locked in for conformity. Look whiskers in the face and line the cards face down. Essentially playing the lottery. Sometimes you win, sometimes you have to land the plane. Silhouettes of a golden day. Burned into my memory like an aching dream. All too far removed from familiar virtues. Sounds of mechanical poo cleaners my closed window. More precise mock-up of a fatal day. Reels of those impartial slivers of tape to use. Like the idea of rain. A dire feeling. The stars felt the pulse of the year. Vain. Locked in the morning, but moving for an end. Took a week off. Lime green ribbons and beads fell upward from the chasm under the bridge. Finally, the first one is back. Where all of us failed is the best part. Stand by and file it under pictures of water bottles staring at the moon. On the 6,666th day, I felt human. So finally, I looked around. Boxes, pictures, it all hit me in my face like things I had never seen before. I saw three number sequences, 13, 16, and two instances of 115. I only get one chance to tear the impression-laden blank page out of my journal, the last remnants of a challenging idiosyncrasy. It's nothing too out of the ordinary. I just felt like the universe had something to say with the way the entire instance played out. Upon the completion of this piece of text, the page comes out, into the bag hanging from my door as its next step, back into the earth like so many papers before it. Does it speak a memory? It's probably how the earth reads. Whatever information it gains from that soon to be crumpled paper, I hope it knows exactly how I feel at this moment and interprets accordingly. I'm merely asking for an understanding, nothing more.
wrote Timepiece. Slow spinning bicycle clown jots his defamations in the nerve log, staring downward at workers below. Without realizing or thinking, his lips reveal he no longer needs the medallion. Confessing along cubes of ice, he drops it by its chain, now a causality of the excavation. The name of this psychosis-induced break for the horizon is Sand Dune, a sparkling landscape, a painting bouncing as a mirage against the walls inside his head. Whittled lips, good luck, bad luck, world heritage. As his burning vehicle halts amongst the beige earth, a fellow in the cloud dictates that a dated jester isn't incongruous in this dotted ground strip, climbing this abandoned drought. He casts his oversized off-white gloves to the voices in the wind, rigid heels dug through the soles, now planting in the terrain, so they last stranded, laid upside down in the dune. Colored polka lines served as an affinity to motion. Six feet higher until the top of the mound, he neglects the opportunity to dig and salute the encompassing blanket noose. The only depression of truth was that the sand was cold, an inexact representation of an unspoken warm sand anecdote. As he crossed the vertex, a shimmering crescent moon clarified the bones of his hands. The approach was complete, so he fixed himself comfortably as the beaded moon stepped down as an unstrange feeling from miles away. He sought peace from the summer, chasing it post reasonably, trailing for what felt like a lifetime into the deserted clasp of the dust, which was in the shoes he left behind, in his stringed lethargic hair, in each drooping fold of his colorful oversized suit, filling every line, crack, and depression of his skin. He himself had become the sand, and sand was peace, sitting as still as everything beside him for miles. It didn't take long to notice that he had been so far removed from any habitual thought structure that he was beyond imagining. So in a sincere attempt at sanity, he thought, thought about imagining. He thought about imagining a clear diamond river out of desperation and thirst, but he realized he wasn't thirsty. This jarring systematic introspection startled him, but as every feeling and sense interpretation arrived at the train station of his psyche in slow motion, he found himself immune to alarm, so he ignored them and entered a tranquil, uncognitive state. Moments later, a flash of a memory affected all reverie. What he failed to notice was that by entering this state, he opened the railway to any passing locomotive confession. So he jumped up and held on by a bar rail as the train got started, mainly as a means of avoiding other possible unwarranted fantasy tram. The only explanation was fortune that this train was a memory, racing ahead of elsewhere freight bearing the statute of limitations on nostalgia. His train was a memory of color, a simple nostalgia, initially interpreted upon first entering the desert while blazing through the dune in a pale automobile. However, the impression persisted past the moment the car called it, and the march began. It was the memory of the color orange, a bright orange goldenrod that was the shape of the sand. In the tangible world, it had become the darkest purple, but as the train chugged, reality and memory became easier to mistake. Confusing, and as they mixed, mind overtook reality. The expanse of the desert became a room, a room of assorted furniture, seemingly an outlying product from a still cognitive area of his brain, inversely dissipating, like maple firewood smoke pouring out of a chimney in his consciousness. The furnished desert room of orange was vast, its dimensions only bound by the limitations of vision. It was the kind of room where every shade abode by a common scheme, everything a lighter or darker extension of orange, although leaving room for the two outermost extremes of the spectrum, presenting that aspect of itself instantaneously. Dead black tree branch outlines stenciled themselves across his sand film face, reflecting invisibly as forms of something real, yet fabrications in and of themselves. This line textured mat beneath his foot planted on a now tile-grained mountain, understood as a sibling to the floor, cousin to the perpendicular rug containing particles of arid land from days and days and days. A melting pot of microbiological culture, hanging out, getting to know one another, splitting off, having arguments, finding soulmates, all in an orange world, reflections of forms scattering in every direction, bouncing off the walls, interacting with forms of completely separate things, interacting with the reflections of his form. Scales line the walls, and a multiplying square engaged in discourse with past iterations of itself, when former Piro realized it was time to start breathing again. A white container of seashells stared at a bench wishing they were closer, items from the sea encased in glass next to cleaners of various 
various reason. Ten pounds of manufactured metal produced for capable folks with time at their expense. Inanimate as usual, even in a space ahead of rules. To Piro, they would easily crash through a window, something like a windshield. Yet his muted mover was left somewhere along the inner edge of the desert. Hours past the mountains surrounding him, which now formed the walls of the room. Everything about the dormant ten-pound weights referenced a vacancy in the once aggravated area of the mind, an area of the mind now fixated on the image of color dispenser can shoes he'd left behind, tying themselves and running paths on the mound, pouring rain in the distant sky, hadn't reached the thrift land yet, and even when it hits, the orange chasm will abide by the rules of its own gravity, lobbied, Perot shatters at the abundance of space but answers his own question circuit. How is it snowing and why is the snow following upwards? Attempted calculations, thinking psychotic, scribing notes in the sand with a stick. Morning will come by with the twenty more passings of the pen stroke, but it won't. It's the first time that the cycle of brightness and grayscale of the day have been disrupted by a room. A room where trains chugging from the skull bound freely in all directions, reverberating down every layer of sediment. Warmer and warmer, pulsing out miles towards and through roof square lots, invoking a buzzing confusion, a questioning of restlessness, and the eventual recognition of incurable unknowings. Yet sleeping in the orange room is as simple as allowing its light fixtures to seep through your retinas, whichever of the two happen to be hanging in the sky, seemingly granting divine permission to use any and all functionality of oneself at their own will. Every bizarre emotion has transpired here before, and the orange room contains all energy, only capable of reproducing it elsewhere and outward. Original copy is still intact, pointing straight at any occupant, mouthing its solar words, each hum a tragic and profoundly blissful needle entering any available pigmented real estate. When you're in the orange room, you're in a jar of honey. You're in a submarine thousands of yards in the center of an electric ocean. You're in between the realms of a mirror. You're in the Rome court of the largest golden warehouse encased in a one-sided glass chamber. The orange room is a clock that tells the time of every time conceived from its construction to the deep future at every moment, over and over. It's both November of last year, yesterday, and the present in the orange room. Although it won't pretend to lie and tell the future, no, the orange room only plays a game it has played before, unlocking itself with a self-constructed key, revealing a mountain of grass intellect, improving continuously for anyone to access if they understand how. So Perrault looked down at his watch, all hands spinning out of control, and remembered peace. In exactly the place he wanted to be, he recited the only words he knew. Locomotive, I gasp for you, as I cannot reach you, as I cannot join ideal structures of intellect before you. Locomotive, I wish I could catch up to you. Locomotive, don't leave too soon. Locomotive, don't exhaust your capabilities. Locomotive, don't run out of stamina before crumpling in atrophy. Locomotive, don't beat your heart like a thin lilac. Locomotive, don't stop glowing. Locomotive, don't stop illuminating my zealous window stare. Locomotive, show me an outline. An outline of a dim door. A dim door leading to a pathway. A pathway of reluctant crystal memory vines. So I can remember selective pleasures. Pleasures of each palette of my being. So I can remember the fabric of a familiar color. So I can remember everything I've ever done. So the strangers behind my eyelids can ease their strain. So the perforations of their respective feelings can split like wood on a tree. Or the slats of Venetian blinds. Locomotive, don't close your eyes like blinds. Locomotive, Locomotive you, you must, must see the end through a view of your own. own. Through your own seldom blue lens before you shift into a skipping dotted line, rippling an unclerical consecularity, before you sleep from reason and witness a pixelated blue skyline cloud. Locomotive, interview me, so we can get to know myself better. Locomotive, don't be a shadow behind a bedsheet mountain for so much longer. Locomotive, don't be the apparitionistic pastel eye in the middle of the room any longer. Locomotive, cross my path once in a while. Locomotive, cross my path and ornately divide your leaves so I can circle towards the hibernative collection of tickets, advects, and push bars we call dreaming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Butter, butter, swing, 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 butter. Yeah. Climbing. Yeah, boy.